that we had the snowstorm that, no, 78, 78 or 79. Anyway, the roof went in and didn't do much good for some of the things in the... But then we had to get a new, another tool shed. Still haven't got room for our car. <laughs> <laughs> And this picture, Lucinda? Well, this is was in, the... Is it in there? This is the um, tool shed. And you can see it has a that slanting roof that is... It isn't the same on both sides. Yeah, salt, it, salt it, box. Yeah, right? and the one side went down. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, the buildings look newer and fresher on this one, don't they? I would guess this was taken from the looks of it, because the porch is on, so it would have to have been after 1925. I would guess in the 30s, maybe. I think when they first started coming around to take aerial po uh, cards, and you see the old house has the kitchen before they took that off. Yeah. Before. The coons got most of it. Um, the other thing that interests me is comparing this picture with this picture. Yeah, you like the old buildings. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, and some, it looks as though some of the, and the one photograph is very old, probably from before the turn of the 20th century, like around 1900. This one? So. The house? 1890. 1890. I, when, the, when this photograph was taken. It, this photograph is older than this other one. Oh, yes, this photograph. much older. And I think in the 80s, but I'm not sure. Okay. I, I only kind of had to guess. The 1880s, the, the, you think? I would think in the 1880s. The, no, this one was taken because Addie had it in her diary in 1896. But that one was taken in the 80s, I think. But as far as the outlet of the house, outline of the house, the porch wasn't put on until 1925. Mm -hmm. That is enclosed. That porch is the same. The only thing now that's different in that's very up to date. The railing isn't up there, but we had to put a new roof on the that part. And you know, Bill Johnson. Yeah. Uh, he he doesn't take much old houses anyway. <laughs> and he uh, he said that every time you put nails in to put a railing on, that you spoil the the roof, and it had leaked before, so that's why we have it, had it done. But uh, otherwise, that hasn't been changed. But the balcony part, where the women are standing up there, yeah. See, these were the two sisters mm -hmm. who didn't marry, mm -hmm. and this, I think, his grandmother, my husband's grandmother. Mm -hmm. In the center of the porch, uh -huh. the lower porch. And I, I don't know about these. I imagine they were hired men. Mm -hmm. On the right. Because they always hired a lot. They always had, they had what's called the suite room upstairs. Mm -hmm. And they had little uh, tables and beds, mostly twin-sized beds. Mm -hmm. Now I think this is the fellow who came here when he was 19. Mm -hmm. But I think this is my father-in-law. I'm just guessing, because mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. The buggy, we know what it is. <laughs> but that was, I think, I think that's still up in the barn. Otherwise, mostly. Now, in this older picture, there are some 
um, barns in there that are no longer standing, or it it it, it looks like that. Oh, in the between, these. Well, the house is certainly still standing, and the hired hand's house is, but some of those barns in the background, like this. Oh one no, they. And this one, I don't know anything about that, except that Grandpa told me that most of the outbuildings were built in 1915, except for, you can see, way back, That's the that one. part of the cow barn, and with the old plain roof, uh, that was 1875. Otherwise, the house is the oldest. I don't know if it identifies anything, but it's pretty hard to, when you weren't exactly there, yes. <laughs> to visualize. The only thing that we do have some written records, and they don't cover enough periods in the area, but they do give you an idea of what goes on. I also have, she, she saved every clipping, I think, that ever came, and I think, uh, a lot of those you could maybe relate. I remember one I looked up, I can't remember what it was now, but on the back of it was something about Teddy Roosevelt's daughter. I think it was Teddy Roosevelt. Got married or was in, in England or something on her honeymoon. I don't know what, what it exactly it was, but there was a cue to what period it was, at least. But. Uh, most of the the really good clippings were in the 80s. We have a box of candy here. You've been making candy. Could you tell us about these? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just sugar and... <laughs> well, what are the different types of candy you have in here? Well, that's, that's toffee. And you make the toffee and then dip it in chocolate. And creams, I make, I only make the kind of creams we like. I make coconut, because I like them. <laughs> I don't know if any of the rest of them do. Uh, I make plain creams. The one kind that I don't, don't make anymore, I just can't handle it, is um, whipped cream center. It's, it's made with um, egg white. I've forgotten what they call it, that they put in. But you add that to the basic sugar and water mixture. But uh, as I say, it's, it's difficult to make because it, I mean, it's very soft when you put the egg white substance in there. So, it's out of the picture. Turners are probably the most popular. Uh, we just kind of dream those up <laughs> and do what you want. A lot of people use like the craft uh, caramels and just melt them down. I don't know how it works, but normally I'd use everything we have. We don't have much anymore. We used to have lots of milk and, and could, and we had eggs. We still have about 15 chickens. But other than that, we don't really have much basic that we used. We didn't, never made butter. I think they must have at one time because I think there's a churn up in the attic. I'm not just sure what period of turn it was. It wasn't an electric one. Um, and you make caramels, right? Yeah, I make the caramels. And you wrap them in wax paper? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you make the caramels from scratch? Yeah. So you don't just use craft caramels and melt them down? No, that's, that's what a lot of people... My daughter is always coming home with some of these trick things that I just never been in the habit of doing, so I don't do it. But um, I don't know that uh, 
it makes any difference. But they like the caramels anyway. So when I have any, see, I, I dip what I want to, or make turtles what I want of, and then the rest of the, rest of the batch I just throw in the pan, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you get them too hard and <laughs> lose your teeth. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're pretty popular. And they help fill up a box. <laughs> and then you have um, peppermint bark in there too. Oh yeah, this is this is really simple. You, the biggest thing is finding a simple peppermint stick that you can grind up, and you um, stick the uh, almond bark in the microwave and, and melt that down and and put the peppermint in it, and that's all it is. So when you're eating fanny mayonnaise, it's, I'm sure they may probably use the same special ingredients. Uh, I think this is, it's such a messy job of dipping. I think I was using, it might have been a cream, but I don't think so. I'll operate it. I still don't know. It's just a hunk of sweet chocolate that I you usually let your sweet chocolate get pretty cool. Then you dip. Otherwise, you're going to um, have a when you take if you take use it in the refrigerator and take it out, and it's had this very soft, hot chocolate. It just will kind of go back to that and get your hands all <laughs> messy. And oftentimes I get in a hurry dipping and I dip before it's ready. But it's all edible, so <laughs> that's what they do with it. Okay. I don't know. I'll, oh, my favorite kind is uh, milk chocolate with um, Rice Krispies, and I like to put kind of big hunks of walnuts in them. And that helps fill the box. <laughs> there are lots, lots of tricks you can try. And, and like the creams, you can make your batch and you can take part of it and put coconut in it if you like nuts. I think nuts are probably the favorite and less likely to. But I don't ask other people, I just do what we like. <laughs> I do care very much for all of the, like pineapple and orange and all that stuff that they put in as fillings, I never do that because I don't like them when I get them out of the box. <laughs> and I noticed the box I gave you, I think, the other day, a couple of weeks ago, I opened it up. It had been in the freezer all that time, and I blamed that on it. But I, I found out later, I, as I went through it, that it was nougats, a nougat filling or a caramel filling. And apparently there weren't any creams in it. So I guess you gamble when you buy candy in the store. You gamble every time you turn around without meaning to. <laughs> um, now you had a group of ladies over here that you were making candy with? Yeah, I just had a couple. And who were they? What, pardon? Who were they? Who did you have over here? Uh, Ellie Peterson. You know Ellie? No. Ellie's a... Well, she and her husband farmed on the Mungerson farm for years. And she... Uh, She's a great person, former school teacher. <laughs> and uh, the other one is a uh, descendant of the Garfields. Betty Stoner, you know her? I, I don't think I've met her. Well, she was a Harley. If it, I, I'm not sure about the ancestry because I never worked on I have enough 
ancestry of my own to try to figure out what happened. But um, the Garfields were a big family, and I think her her grandmother was a Garfield. I'm not sure, but she had been wanting to come make candy, so I said, "Well, you can come." Does she live in Chicago? She lives in Arlington Heights, I think. Now, okay, I might think be Palatine. Okay. It's one, one of the... I, I think maybe I have met her. But Candy um, Harley. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, she's come out to visit. she's a sister-in-law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've met Betty then. Uh, she's a nice lady. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Real sweet. Um, no, it was, it was kind of a fun thing. And it was, the nice thing was that they did all the dishes. <laughs> One of the hard parts about candy making, almost anything you do in the kitchen, dirty dishes. Kids are, of course, the <laughs> best source, but uh, there's always dishes. And you think you've got them all cleaned up, and you go out and find a whole batch more. <laughs> yep. One of the joys of homemaking. <laughs> Um, uh, something we wanted to talk to you about today, Lucinda, was what it was what it was like for you growing up in the area, and then being on the farm here. Um, I grew up on a farm. And where was that? Well, uh, it's a, on Muirhead Road, about six miles from here. Muirhead Road is parallel to Crawford Road and to Corn Road. Mm -hmm. And and who were your mother and father? John Muirhead married Elizabeth Beath. The Muirheads came from Scotland originally. And uh, well, the beast came from Scotland, too. And my grandmother was Richmond. So they were all pretty much Campton or Plato Township people. And what did your father do for a living? Farmed. What kinds of things did he farm, Lucinda? Well, when I was at home, it was mostly dairying. Then they turned to beef. Mm -hmm. uh, and what were their, what was your father's full name? John. Uh-huh. Oh. He, didn't, he didn't have a middle name. Okay. I don't think he did. And I didn't have a middle name okay. until I got married. I could use M. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, it meant something. <laughs> um, and where did you go to school? Well, I went, went to four years to a country school. And then we... My older brother was in the new high school at Plato Center, Plato Township High School. And so when it rained, there were no buses. Uh, when it rained, they'd come after us with a buggy or yeah, horses or something. And it made it easier to have us all in one school. So when I was in fifth grade, I went into a two-room school at Plato. And I went to Plato High School and Wheaton College and Northwestern University. And, and what did you study at Wheaton College and Northwestern? Well, I majored in history in Wheaton College. And then I got a job during the Depression in Plato teaching and 
So I, uh, and I, and the job was in English. So when I went to Northwestern, I took English and got my MA in English. Did you have a specialty of study or some, some favorite things in English? Well, not, not really. It was just a BA um, and an MA. I uh, can't remember which school it was in now. Do you have some favorite authors? Pardon? Do you have some favorite authors or poets? Oh, I always like to read. My, uh, I always found it a good excuse to get out of chores that I didn't like doing. Uh, w one of my favorite stories, I have more stories than anything else, I guess. But we used to watch cows on the road. And I know you're too young to know what it meant to watch cows. But the high, the, especially the country roads had a lot of grass growing. So this nice green grass in the spring was just like giving cows candy. <laughs> they loved, loved to go out. So we'd ta take the cows out and let them uh, graze like for an hour or two, or two hours. And I always got to go at the end of the line because uh, I had a book to read. Sometimes it was even a history book. I remember reading my... Eighth, my brother's eighth grade history book when I was like in seven, six, fifth or sixth. No, I must have been younger than that. But nobody could understand why I wanted to read the history, history books. But uh, anyway, uh, this one day, I don't know if it happened more than once, but it made a good story once, was um, I was at the end of the line, which is about a mile from home, and uh, I was interested in what I was doing, and the cows weren't bothering me. And pretty soon the mailman came and he said, Cindy, they're putting the, they put the cows in quite a while ago, and you're supposed to come home. <laughs> the, the, the other kid on the other end <laughs> had, when the cows were done eating or when the time was up, I, I suppose some of the men helped him. I don't know. I don't know how it worked there because I was never on the other end. But uh, I always thought that was kind of funny. They had to come and tell me to, to come home for dinner. Um, do you remember your first day of school? Well, yeah, I remember my first teacher. And I ran into her after I was married, and she was living in a subdivision down on Corn Road. At that time, she was teaching in Chicago. But the teachers got out of, well, if they went to high school, at, at the end of eighth grade, they would go to DeKalb, maybe for a summer session, maybe for, then in later years, it was two years, and then eventually, of course, they had to have a, a bachelor's. But DeKalb, that northern now, was a very popular uh, teacher's school. In fact, it was called, when I, I think when I was in college, we used to play DeKalb teachers. I don't know if this is very... It, when, when you were still in the, it was a one-room schoolhouse initially that you mm -hmm. were in, what was that like? Oh, it was great. There were about 10 of us. And if you didn't like what you were studying, you could always listen to what the other guys were doing in the upper grades. I guess that one of the things I remember most about that was there was a the farmhouse right next to the school, and um, they uh, 
we had to get water from there. You've been in uh, uh, on Dean Street. Oh, Shoals School? Yeah, mm -hmm. Shoals. I used to, you wouldn't believe it, I used to you do uh, volunteer work there. But um, we uh, would go over and get this water pail filled. But since I was only in fourth grade, there were a lot of older kids, and they were the ones who were chosen. But they could take one little kid along with them. And I was just looking forward to the time when I would be big enough <laughs> to care, take the, the, uh, uh, the pail and do the thing. And I'm not sure how, that I realized how soon that time would come. <laughs> when you're big enough to do almost anything and can't do anything. <laughs> Life moves on. Yeah. Um, what did you used to do in the afternoons when school was over, when you would go home? Did you have chores or...? Well, they are supposed to be helping my mother. But my mother used to say, that if my father had had um, all girls instead of a couple of boys, that uh, he would have them working outside. <laughs> and that was true. And we, we preferred to work outside because it was a little different. It depended on the season of the year. Sometimes we... Uh, Oh, and uh, I remember one of the things I hated was we had to pick up corn after they had husked and uh, throw it on the way, and then we'd start throwing the corn at each other. And you know how kids are. You have to find entertainment wherever you are, and we did. What other kinds of things would you do when you? Let's say in the winter time, this time of year, when you would come home from school, you just come home to read or do schoolwork. Or well, I'd read when they'd let me. My favorite thing always was. I don't think any of you would, either of you would ever have had anything to do with the Horatio Elger series. Always but, one of my mother's favorites. She talks about that. <laughs> you know, when I was a, a kid. Uh, my father, uh, my brother was seven years older than I was, so he had all these boys' books, and I loved Horatio Alger. And the favorite thing was she's reading Tom the Bootleg again, <laughs> and I read reread the stories. Uh, so that that sort of thing was always entertainment, and we had a big family. So, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have had two sisters and two brothers. In the spring, did you have special things to do after school or? Well, I, I can't remember that, that we did much with the gardening. I can remember in the summer we went barefoot, and when we had to go on the, in, out to the oats field, and I can't even remember what kind of a weed it was, but it, it was yellow, like, like mustard or something like that, and we had to pull that out. Now, that's just one of the jobs I hated. But as I say, I, I was out. If I could, I was always reading. Libraries were pretty far from us, and uh, if you know how much libraries mean to kids these days, it's something that I felt. I think I had to wait till I was working on my master's at Northwestern. I had made a list of all the 
the classics that I hadn't read, and and I spent the whole year before I took my finals uh, reading up on classics. I was teaching at the same time. And what were some of those books, if you can remember just a few titles? Oh, I loved Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice, all the things that went with it. I loved Shakespeare, but I can't say that I read too much of it on my own before I got in advanced studies. And I have always liked nonfiction. I much prefer that to, well, especially the type of so-called literature that you get these days. I, I just prefer the, the old-fashioned type of thing. And my son always says, Baba says, Mom, you just like things with a sick, happy ending. <laughs> That's probably true. Did you, did you ever read any of the Greek classics, Ulysses, or...? Yeah, but don't ask me anything about them. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a most interesting teacher in Wheaton. She was, she must have been in her 70s, although I'm not, not a very good judge of age, but um, she would quote, from some of these Shakespeare, different ones. And she'd pick out things that were, and you know you can do it with Shakespeare. There's almost anything to <laughs> prove a point. And then she'd sniff. <laughs> and if somebody, and we always had chapel, and if the speaker would say something that she particularly approved of, she'd sniff. <laughs> and it, it was a real big joke among the she was she was a delightful person. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any hobbies when you were growing up? Or uh, other other things you liked to do, like sewing or collecting things, or no, I don't. I don't think I. I didn't do. I had home ec in high school. No, in grade school. No, 4-H. <laughs> I'm trying to think where I did have it and didn't do very much with it. The only thing I told my mother, I had learned how to rip. <laughs> what do you mean by that? You'd learn how to rip? Yeah. You, you know, you sew something on the machine and you uh, pull it apart way and it go, go on the other side. Uh, and it helps very much if, if you know how to rip. <laughs> I mean... You can take it out, whereas most of the things I needed taking out, they weren't doing too well. And I can't say that I cared too much about sewing or, or anything like that. I'd much rather read. But um, as I grew older, especially when I was teaching, I used to, you can't believe I did it, but I used to get down on the floor with my patterns and cut out dresses and stuff. And I, I enjoyed that. I did it. I did it uh, with my kids, for my kids. You, for, would, you would sew things for the children? Yeah. Uh -huh. that, uh, there was a period, I think it was in the 50s, maybe, 60s, when our feed for the chickens came in flowered sacks you don't remember that? Mm -hmm. You do? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's <laughs> something. Anyway, uh, I used to make Sally dresses. At that time, they made dresses. And I remember saying to my sister-in-law, who had an older uh, child, oh, what cute dresses Liz wearing. And she said, yeah, but she said, I don't know why I'm making it. She'll be wearing your father's shirt. 
next. Do you remember when style got to be that the girls would wear these great big shirts and and uh, I don't I don't think Liz ever did it, but these dresses that uh, Catherine made were really cute. I can't say anything I did was especially I rather knit. I learned to knit during World War II. And I still like to, but I I don't do I don't do much of anything now. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things would you knit? I mean, what got you started knitting during World War II? Well, I would say during the war, I thought it was real smart because nobody else would do it, and I had had a pattern, and I knitted gloves for the guys in the, in the service, and I think they must have <laughs> just hated them, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it was like in, in the war. Was that before you were married, Lucinda? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm So you would knit gloves for the servicemen? And the well, that was one of the things. None of the, the older, better knitters really cared much about trying anything, and I would try things. And they're, they're nice and little, easy to hold. And even at that time, maybe I was thinking more of myself. And I got done faster. But mm -hmm. I did like knitting. Mm -hmm. Crocheting, I was never very good at. I tried to teach my daughter to, to crochet. And it was like the blind leading the blind. But uh, I also tried to teach her knitting. Well, she ended up liking to crochet. She crocheted that thing for me. She's still teaching, so she doesn't have time to do much now. But um, she made me an afghan, a few things. And she's made quite a few baby things, and she's always bringing me yarn. And I, in the last few years, I've, I've done, oh, you know, these ski sweaters with different colors, and I made one there for my granddaughter, and I never saw her wear it, so I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> I was impressed, but I guess she didn't. I, I think she thought it was too warm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever play a musical instrument? Yeah, no. no. I played the piano for my own amazement. <laughs> to quote, what was it? Jane Ace. <laughs> and uh, other than that, I just had no. Special music, I like to sing. Now I can't do anything as far as that goes. But um, I can't think that I had any special talents. Mm -hmm. The what? only thing I did do was a lot of book reviews. You would write book reviews? No. I would get programs with book reviews of books, books that I liked, or, or books that they liked. You would get together with a group of other ladies or people? And, and no, this that? was like for ladies' aid, women's clubs, and stuff like that, where they wanted someone. I started doing it in connection, I guess, with devotions, mostly. And I had quite a few people whom I regularly visited, but that's, that's about the only special thing I did. All very boring. <laughs> Well, no, you would, you would read a book and then go to get together with the group and talk to them about the book? Well, we did that in a book club where we each did it. So we took a, took a different book. Now that, we did True Women's Club, and that was a group of ladies. But this other, you had them at your mercy. <laughs> you just talked about the book, what you liked about it, and more or less a critique of it. 
That's it. Um, did you have any pets when you were growing up? Oh, we always had dogs. And they were always getting killed on the road. And I can remember when we'd bring the dog in the house and my dad did not approve of our having dogs in the house. So we kind of sneaked them in and out. But other than that, we had lots of, I think we always had a great affection for like little calves and, and cats. But I, I never liked cats very well. I liked the dogs better. Um, what kinds of special things would your family do on weekends or in the evenings? Well, in case you don't know it, a weekend is pretty much like any other day as far as a dairy is concerned. They don't know it's Sunday, so... You have to do all these things that need to be done. And I would say mostly we, uh, we went to visit relatives. My grandmother lived 10 miles away. We used to go there. Uh, and I guess you would say some of the happiest times we spent were maybe in her attic or in the backyard, playing ball with the, the other cousins, but because most of them came once in a while. Now, which grandmother was that? Well, I had two Rearhead cousins. I had two Beats cousins. And uh, the suitors were... Uh, on my Uncle Will B's wife's family, and they lived lived there, so they were always there. So there was always a pretty good crowd. We could have a ball game or something. So when all the cousins got together, like there were twenty of you or something. Well, probably more like. Twelve, but then Uncle Will was always a kid with us. He, he would always play with us. One of my favorite people. And what do you remember about him, Lucinda? And maybe just because he liked it. He had a, de a definite sense of humor. He said that. Uh, I remember he came to see me. I had pneumonia. He was sick, and he said, well, she isn't talking so much today anyway. <laughs> I, I felt like saying something, but he, cause he thought I didn't know enough to <laughs> say anything. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Uncle Will was one of my favorites. Was he a beef or a mirehead? He was a beef. But Uncle Will Muirhead was... Uncle Will Muirhead was the one that told me all the family history. I wrote the Muirhead history when I was, well, before I was married. And uh, I got a lot of the information from Uncle Will Muirhead, and he, he would tell, he told the best stories. And he would tell all these stories and then he'd say, uh, I'd ask him about something. And he'd say, where did you hear that? And I'd say, well, Aunt Lou told me. And he said, oh, Lou's crazy. She doesn't know what, remember that. I think Aunt Lou was a little younger than he was. But I would go back and forth between the two of them. <laughs> I, didn't have, I didn't have the source of material that I had here. Of course, I didn't have anybody here to tell me either. I worked on, when I worked on Canton history, uh, the, um, 
it was a, I'd just catch a little bit of it here and I'd remember Mother would talk about when she was a girl. She was born on Beef Road and lived over in that area. And she would talk, mention names of people. And I, I just wish that I'd listened to her more. But uh, I guess the only reason I started working on the Hampton history was because I had found a lot of material that sort of pertained to the township. One of the, I don't know if you, have you read the Campton history? Uh, one of the most delightful things in the Campton history is a story that was, was written by, it was a, a local story written by, can't think of his name. He was a Garfield. Franklin Green, perhaps? Hmm? Franklin Green Garfield? No. No, this was back in those days. I had the clipping of, that Abby sure. had kept, and uh, so I put it in there. But it, it told about a Campton Township meeting that was held in Lakes Barn. And Lakes Barn is over on the intersection of the Burlington and Silver Glen. I suppose it was a log cabin. But told about the election in 1844, the first presidential election in the township. And uh, this was written in 1888, I think. 44 years later, and it mentioned that everybody in that first election who voted, um, and there were seven of them, I don't know if I can recall all of them, Robert Corn was one, uh, the Garfield who wrote the article was another, the um, Lakes another, and uh, I can't think about it right now, but these seven people voted again in uh, 88, and I just love the way they write. he wrote. He said, uh, In those days, men were not afraid to say what they thought and were very, there was no stuffing the ballot box. I don't think he used that word, but none of that. It was straight from the shoulder and the books were open all day long and you come in, could come in and see who voted and how they voted. And then in, in the article, he tells how Robert Corn voted, I think, Clay was one of the thing I can't remember the three of them. Clay, who signed Polk, and the three contestants. I can't remember who the third one was. But anyway, it it told who Robert Corn voted for. Men were not ashamed, <laughs> and I thought it was kind of delightful. <laughs> uh, this um, and I wasn't so sure about that there was no stuffing of the belt. <laughs> it's a little bit like the I was telling Dave here about the uh, the story that this uh, relative from uh, Chicago who worked for the fire department wrote about uh, the. Uh, Chicago Fire, and he told how generous the whole world had been when the fire broke out. And they said all this thing, and then he said, ended something to the effect that you just wonder how much of it goes to the right source. And I think that's so true of today. We're still doing the same thing. Um, 
Um, did your ch uh, family belong to a particular church congregation? Mostly? Methodist. Methodist? Uh -huh. and, and where did they go to church? In Plato? In Plato. And what was the name of the church? Plato Methodist Church, but now that has gone in with an Elgin group. I don't think there are many Plato people left in it. It's the Cornerstone Church. They just built a new church on Russell Road in Plato. But I would say it's primarily Elgin people. Did your family take vacations when you were growing up? <laughs> if it was between milkings. <laughs> I would imagine it was very difficult to get away from a dairy farm. It is. Yeah. Well, we had, Bob and I had a wonderful trip to Europe. We had a friend who had just quit farming, and we got, we got away for three weeks, and it, it was great. But uh, And then when the boys got older, we could get away a little better, but he was still pretty active. What year did you and your husband take a trip to Europe? 66. Uh-huh. That was 1966. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Do you remember your first car? First what? Your first automobile. I think it was Rio, R-E-O, I'm not sure, it may not have been. The one I remember best, I was about, well, I was nine, but when my sister died, you know, back in those days, you used what car you had if you had one, and uh, we had a Vili. V E L I E, and they, uh, it had, it was seven passenger, had two little seats in the middle, and I remember, uh, for the funeral, we had that. So I, I Elizabeth died in nineteen nineteen. So. And you were telling um, Dave and I some instances of traveling before you had automobiles, or maybe you had one, but alternate modes of transportation that were like older. Well, uh, the best transportation we had, I guess, was with a buggy. And it was usually my mother driving. She never drove a car. But she drove a horse, and uh, we would get to go, like I say, between milkings. But in thrashing time, we, the men always got two meals where they went. They'd get the dinner, and then they'd have supper, too. So that kind of gave us, and I, one of the things I remember uh, most is the... Uh, Automobile races in, in uh, Elton. They had, you know, where Larkin High School is, mm -hmm. and uh, they. I think they start. I don't know which way they started, but they went down uh, McLean Boulevard to Highland Avenue. Came west on Highland Avenue to. I don't remember the road that goes across to Edina, but they came into Edina, if you know where Edina is, and um, then took 20 goes through Edina, the oldest road in the area. 
and uh, the 20 in the back to Larkin. I think it was something like five miles. It was in 1923. And I remember my mother taking us kids to the, um, when the, the family was away, uh, the older ones were away thrashing, but we went to the Udina Schoolhouse, not the Udina Schoolhouse, the East Udina Schoolhouse, uh, where it's still Nestle Road, you know, where Nestle Road comes into 20. And at the end of Nestle Road, you may have been watching, if you've been in this area long, uh, there's a, they've been working on, I think a church owns part of that land right in the corner. Well, that used to be the East Udina Schoolhouse, and it had this outdoor privy, <laughs> all, all the things that, that one needed. We took our picnic basket and we watched the cars practice. See, they were practicing on the route. So that was a big thing in our. And there were, always, there were always special things. Fourth of July and... How did you celebrate the Fourth of July? Pardon? How would you celebrate the 4th of July? Oh, with firecrackers, <laughs> if we could afford them. We always had, somebody always had something. And we always had big picnics. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like to travel by buggy in the winter time? Well, mostly we used the sleigh if there was snow. Otherwise, I, re I was just recalling one Christmas, the roads weren't very good for traveling because all the country roads were pretty bad. And uh, there was enough snow, so the family went to Grandma's for Christmas, as we always did. Uh, with the, the bobsled, but uh, we also had a, but I don't even remember riding in it, we had a, a, four, a two passenger, not four passenger, I should say, buggy. It wasn't a rumble seat, but it had the two seats in it. And somebody borrowed it for a, uh, I think it was a Farm Bureau parade on the 4th of July, and we never got it back. So that's one of the things. That... Um, do you remember when electricity first came to the oh, area? Yeah. What was that like for you? Well, before that, folks had had a, uh, I think it was a Delco plant or something like that. And it, it's like the same principle that they have in hospitals and emergencies. And we had that, but I remember my aunt who didn't have it, said she thought that's why we had such poor eyesight in our family, <laughs> because <laughs> they, the power would go down. You had to have a, an engine running it, and the power would go down, then your lights would get dim. So even though it was better than the, than the uh, lamp light, it, it still wasn't very good. But I think that's when we first...